Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for having me back. It's good to see that I haven't scared everyone off. Um, <clears throat> so let me remind you what we've done. So last time. Oh, so first of all, let me remind you what our mission statement is. We want to study homeo zero of the surface. And we want to try and do this with geometry. And our final goal will be to show that some fragmentation norm on homeo zero is unbounded. So you're also going to Katie Mann's course. Katie said, oh yeah, and this fragmentation norm, maybe no one was confused about this, but I'm gonna bring it up anyway. Yes, so right, so all this, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's two things people call fragmentation norm. So the thing I'm using, I should be calling conjugacy invariant fragmentation norm because I'm taking all of the disks and I'm not fixing a cover a priori. So you should expect that in my fragmentation norm, uh, the norms are much, much smaller because I have an enormously bigger generating chain set. So this is why it is sort of harder to show that I have infinite diameter in that norm. Um, just if you were confused how the different, con the different fragmentations relate. Okay, then, then we sort of pivoted away completely from homeomorphism groups last time. And we started talking about the curve graph. And we'll eventually get back to homeomorphisms. But for now, we are still in this setting where S is a closed surface, genus G. And what we built was this curve graph. And we've shown that this is hyperbolic. Right? So this was this gadget where I took an isotopy class for every curve. I connected them by an edge if they are disjoint. And we use these bicorn surgery paths to show that this is a gamma hyperbolic space. Why do I care? I care because the mapping class group, so this is all the homeomorphisms, let's say orientation preserving up to isotopy, acts on this thing as simplicial automorphisms. And as geometric group theorists, we like group actions on hyperbolic spaces, except well, a priori, this could just be some diameter 10 thing. And then this doesn't tell me anything. So we better make sure that this is a big space and that this action is interesting. We even have a chance of saying something clever. So that's what we're going to do today. That's the first thing we're going to do today. So I need to talk a little bit about distance bounds. Uh, is your little arrow here deliberately denoting a reaction or such as how you draw it? That's just how I draw them. Okay. My actions are from the left. Yeah. So my action is like, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of these as maps. I'm multiplying from the left. Yes. So, okay. Uh, so distance bounds. So there's two kinds of distance bounds. There's upper distance bounds and lower distance bounds. Uh, upper ones won't be super interesting, but I want to say one word about them anyway. So the distance between alpha and beta can be bounded from above in terms of intersection number, right? This is sort of a byproduct of, of what we did yesterday. As I start marching through the different bicorns, uh, as I do more and more bicorn surgeries, I start removing more and more intersections. So from this, you can easily see that there's some linear function of intersection number bounds distance. You can do beta, if uh, you're more clever about the surgery, you can get a logarithmic upper bound because you can always cut. Your next cut is always so that you lose half of the intersections you saw, saw before. So upper bounds aren't so bad just from, from something we can see. Um, it's also clear that no such lower bounds exist, right? So I can take just a curved surface here. And now what are my two curves? Well, I'm gonna draw three curves. Uh, one is this, um, one is this, and the next one goes wild on this side of the surface. So what's the point here? The point is that the green and the yellow can have arbitrary intersection while still being distance two in the curve graph. So the distance can be two, while the intersection number can be arbitrarily. Right, so this is, uh, this is why it's much harder 
to get lower bounds of distance because the shape of the curve with respect to any sort of geometric picture you have, might have in mind can change drastically as I make one or two steps in the curve graph. So how can I get lower bounds? Well, here's a cool lemma. Or, no, I like this lemma. Uh, this was sort of a hidden secret for a while until I, I don't know, now I shout it out at every, every opportunity. So this uh, is due to Hempel, uh, who used the curve graph to study three manifolds. And it's a very simple lemma, but it says the following. It says that if the distance between two curves in the curve graph is at most n, then there exists a cover of my surface of degree at most two to the n, where alpha and theta have disjoint lifts. Right? So having lots of intersections isn't good enough to get lower bounds, but having lots of intersections in covers is good enough to get lower bounds. And so how does this work? So connect alpha and beta by a path uh, let's say let's do this for now so assume that alpha and beta are non-separating if you were at the recitation you know that the non-separating curve graph is let me actually phrase it like this no one can read this so it's enough to prove this for the non-separating curve graph. So in the recitation, we proved that the non-separating curve graph is quasi-isometric to the curve graph. And in fact, the inclusion is one dense and an isometric embedding. So this two here will absorb the fact that it's only one dense. So I'm replacing alpha and beta by disjoined, um, by disjoined, uh, by disjoint um, uh, non-separating curves. And now I'm just going to work with non-separating curves. So these non-separating guys now have distance at most n plus two. And then observe if I have gamma i minus one, gamma i, gamma i plus one. So this is supposed to be three curves, uh, a length three path, in the non-separating curve graph, then how does the picture look? So the picture looks like this. There's some non-separating curve here. That's the middle one. And then there's the two curves here that I don't quite know about. So there's gamma i minus one. And then there's the complicated one, gamma i plus one. Now you can maybe already see what I'm going to do and why there's a two uh, to the power or something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the degree two cover defined by the, the green curve. I'm going to draw it and then I'm going to write it and then you'll see. So I'm cutting the surface open at the green curve and I'm assembling two copies of it. And this defines a, this defines a degree two cover. So in words, Hank, the degree to cover, uh, let's call this maybe sigma prime of S by cutting at sigma I and observe that now because gamma I minus one and gamma I plus one are both disjoint from the green down here, they admit disjoint lists. So then gamma i minus one, gamma i plus one, admit, yeah, let's write this here, disjoint lifts. So what does this tell us? This tells me that at the price of passing to a degree two cover, I can replace a segment of length, sort of two, a lot of length three. So three adjacent vertices joined by two edges up to going to an index two cover, I can replace this by two disjoint things, right? And now you now you just induct. So now in
Is the lemon still true for closed circuits? Uh, yeah, yes, if you phrase it correctly. So, so for non-separating curves, this, this always works. Um, and that's the case that we will need later. Um, so if I cared a lot about- If you care a lot about, right. So, so yes, I mean, if you, yeah, no, this is, still, this is still true. You can also take covers defined by arcs, for example, on punctured surfaces. You can also cut along arcs. So even if you're in this situation where you, uh, where you're in the bad situation, you build a cover where you're cutting along an arc, and then you again have two copies, and you and you can lift. So this this trick always works, right? So so I've been, I've been happy with this. So I start with a path, some path of length, uh, say n, in the non-separating curvograph of uh, of S then I can lift it to a path of length n minus one in the curve graph for some sigma prime where this is a two to one, right? Where I've unwrapped one of these. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you for this, thank you for this comment. So uh, when I say lifts, maybe what I should say is elevations. Does this make you happier? So, so I'm taking the smallest power. I'm taking the smallest power that lifts. So it's a it's a component. These are finite covers. So some power of a of a closed loop always lifts, and I'm taking the smallest power that does. And so if two curves are disjoint, and I've picked some lift for the first one, then I can pick a disjoint lift for the other one, of course. So I can do this local modification, collapsing a length two segment to a length one segment, and just continue lifting, lifting the rest, right? And then by induction, you get, you get this lemma. Okay, why is this good? This is good because in the recitation, we have seen a robust way of how you can take homeomorphisms and make them act so that curves start intersecting each other. So now let's put all of this together. So now, suppose that S is square tiled. So think about this, right? You take those three squares, you glue them, you get a genus three surface. And F is an affine homeo uh, with derivative, a hyperbolic matrix uh, with irrational, eigendirections in the sense of the problem set or the recitation. So in these charts, this is an affine map and the derivative has irrational eigendirections. Now, the observation is that these square tiled structures play nice with covers. So if sigma to S is a finite cover, there exists an N such that F to the N lifts to sigma, and they can also lift the square tiled structure, right? I can pull back, if you want, think of these square tiled structures as branched covers over the torus. You can pull this back along the actual cover from S to S uh, to, till, uh, to sigma to get one of these square tiled structures on sigma. Um, so then for the induced uh, square tile structure on sigma, a lift f tilde of f to the n still has this property. So let's call this, right? Because being a derivative, being affine, having a derivative of a certain type, that's a local property. So this behaves nicely undertaking covers. Why is this good? This is good because this, of course, means that for any um, alpha in S, any lifts alpha tilde one, alpha tilde two of alpha to sigma, F tilde to the K alpha is not disjoint 
from alpha two for k large. That was what the little dynamics in the recitation was for. So what we did in the recitation was we said that if I have such a map, which is affine on a square tiled structure, and the derivative has an irrational eigendirection that it pulls in, then as I start iterating this curve, alpha one tilde is going to get pulled in this irrational eigendirection. And this forces it to intersect this alpha two tilde at some point. Aha, but that means that the curve graph has to have infinite diameter. And in fact, the orbits of F have infinite diameter. So a corollary is that F as above acts on C S with infinite diameter. And so the proof is by contradiction, if not, so if the diameter in the curve graph of an orbit would be finite, then for any n, so then for any n, this distance would be less than k. This would give us a cover, let's maybe call this the cover n. So this is a cover of, degree at most two to the k, where the two things admit disjoint lifts. But this degree is uniformly bounded. And there's a finite number of such covers. So this means that there's a common finite super cover of all of them. But then there exists a finite cover sigma over s covering all sigma n such that alpha and f to the n alpha have disjoint lifts to sigma. And this is now a contradiction to this, right? This contradicts that in this single cover, a lift, a suitably high powered lift of this will mix up everything. So this is essentially, uh, this is essentially Hempel's proof that the curve graph has infinite diameter. Mazur and Minsky proved this differently um, by somehow realizing that a boundary point should be a geodesic lamination, but let's not talk about it. Okay, uh, we've learned an important lesson this morning, which is no one likes parabolic elements. Uh, I second that. So even though this thing has infinite diameter, Maybe some people like parabolic. Parabolic elements are kind of cool, but you're much happier. Your life is easier if you deal with hyperbolic ones. So, or luxodromic ones. So it would be nice to see if this is a luxodromic element or a parabolic one. In fact, it, there are no parabolics uh, in the curve graph, which is nice. So this F is actually a, a act luxodromically. So in fact, this is a theorem due to Mazur and Minsky, um, which says that any mapping class acts on the curve graph either loxodromically or has uh, or elliptic. Um, and you can do a bit better. This is essentially sort of a curve graph Nielsen Thurston classification. Either you're loxodromic or you're finite order or a power fixes an actual point. So, so it's pretty good. Um, I don't have time, but you can use the fact, so this is on the problem set. And if you want, we can talk about this in the next recitation or just find me over coffee. You can prove by hand that F to the N alpha and F to the minus N alpha uh, have very big Gromov products. So if I positively iterate and if I negatively iterate, the Gromov product gets really big uh, for the one that we've built. And that will tell you that it's loxodromic because this means that as I go forward and backward, I go to two different boundary points. And where does this come from? This comes from the fact that this goes to one of the eigendirections of F and this goes to the other eigendirection of F. 
And then you do a little bit more dynamics to observe that something that is very close to one of them and something that's very close to the other always has a short surgery. There's always a certain, yeah, question? Yeah, 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 yes. Sorry, yes, 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 yes. It doesn't go to infinity, sorry. It's not parabolic. So if I go forward and backward, then um, the two things go to different places. And so where does this come from? This comes from the fact that something that is almost pointing in one of the eigendirections, if I surgery this to something that's almost in the other eigendirection, there's a short surgery because the, say, vertical lines quickly return to the horizontal lines if the vertical and horizontal are both minimal. And so then you combine this with the, with the fact that surgery sequences are quasi-geodesics, and it tells you that anything that's close to one of the endpoints dips back before it goes to the other. Or you read um, Giotto and Alessandro's uh, wonderful paper and actually use the flat geometry to get a projection onto the axis. They can tell you what the axis is. Okay, um, what have we done? What have we done? So what we've done now is we have built a hyperbolic graph on which the mapping class group of a surface acts, and we've exhibited at least one element that acts as a loxodromic, and it acts very nicely. And uh, I will now take a bit of a... So, so we've heard lots of words before, and I should say that this action is really nice. So you have WPD elements, for example. So for most choices of these things, this is not just, uh, this is not just a hyperbolic, but this is actually a WPD hyperbolic. So you have an acylindrical action, and you got lots of nice. Um, I'll now take a sort of sharp turn to the side, and the rest of today, we'll talk about something completely different. So what we'll be talking about, we will briefly be talking about quasimorphisms. Remember, that it was the other ingredient. The big large-scale outline was to prove the thing about fragmentation, first get an action on a hyperbolic space. We don't have that yet. Then use that action to get a quasimorphism. Once you have this, use standard facts about fragmentation and you're done. So everything is a little bit tenuous, but at least I've shown you how to build a hyperbolic space for the mapping class group. And now I want to show you how you get quasimorphisms from hyperbolic spaces. And I'm not sure if everyone knows this. So I'll start by telling you what a quasimorphism is. So let G be a group. A quasimorphism on G is a map. And again, this is maybe not the most general definition, but that's the one that I want to use. This is a map from G into the reals, so that, well, what should this be? So what would a homomorphism be? A homomorphism would be something where if I take two group elements and I compare the sum of the values on uh, G and G prime, so I'm summing phi of G plus phi of G prime, and I subtract the value on G, G prime, for a homomorphism, this would be zero. That's exactly the homomorphism property. So to quasify this, we're simply going to say that this doesn't, uh, this doesn't break too badly. So if I take the supremum over all group elements and I'm doing this, then I want this to be less. So let's call this maybe D, uh, the defect, and I want this to be finite. So that's what a quasimorphism is. It's not a priori clear that this is a good thing to stare at, but this is a good thing to stare at. Who has already seen quasimorphisms before? Many of you. Who has never seen quasimorphisms? For you? I don't believe you. Uh, okay, some of you have never seen quasimorphisms before, which is good. Uh, because then, then, then I'll, you learn something new. And I'll quickly tell you some, some examples. Um, I'll tell you the, the most important example. Okay, well, fine. So here's one example, uh, a homomorphism. I think math math mathematicians are contractually obligated to sometimes start with stupid examples no one learns anything from. So, so I'm paying my dues here. Uh, 
so here's some here's some examples. So you can take an actual homomorphism. Uh, why why do I not like that? Uh, well, I like homomorphisms, but many groups I like don't have any interesting ones, right? You will have homomorphisms to R, uh, then um, you're not simple, for example, right? That's sort of a that's a problem. And and homeo zero is simple, and so in the setup that I really want, there won't be any homomorphisms. There's something else you can do. You can take bounded maps. Uh, just pick a random number between minus D and D for every group element. That's going to be a quasimorphism. That's clearly silly. Um, so how do we get an interesting quasimorphism? Here's the core example of an interesting quasimorphism. These are the so-called counting quasimorphisms on the free group. And uh, these are due to Brooks. And so how does this work? Well, what we're going to do is you're going to pick a reduced word. Let's say, yeah, pick a reduced word, uh, W in Fn. So I'm going to do examples for everything. So let's say W is something like AB in F2, which is F with the free basis AB for me. Um, and then what you can do is you can do the following. So for any other reduced word, um, G maybe, what you can do is you can count how often does W appear in G. So to fix things, let's say that the count of W in G is the maximal number of non-overlapping copies of W in G. Right, so this is, this is just a count. This is something very simple. Um, <clears throat> so for example, uh, right? So for example, if I count the number of copies of, w, of say AB in whatever, A squared, B squared, uh, that would be one. Right, so I write this as A, A, B, B, and then I'm asking myself, how often do I see A, B as a substring here? Uh, and I see it once, right? That's, that's what I'm doing. This is very simple. And now what I can do is I can put, so claim that H, W of G, where I'm looking at, how many copies are there of W in G minus how many copies are there of the inverse word in G inverse? Let me write this as W inverse as well. This is a quasimorphism. Great. Um, so observe that if W would be something like A itself, then this would just be the standard morphism. To, to homology, right? If you're counting how often does A appear minus how often does A inverse appear, that's the exponent sum of A. So that would actually be a homomorphism. But if you're counting copies of AB, this is not a homomorphism anymore, right? Because if you're counting copies of AB in A, there's none. If you're counting copies of AB in B, there's none. But if you're counting copies in AB to, to the million, there's a million. So even though the value on the generators is, is zero, the value on, on certain elements can be really large. Should that really be inverses for both of them? In no, thank you. It's you're counting inverse of W in, in, in G. Otherwise, of course, it's very not what I want. Okay, so that's a claim. Why is this a quasi-morphism? So this has to do with the fact that the free group looks like a tree. So let's draw the Cayley tree for, and so this is the proof. So the proof that this is indeed a quasimorphism. Um, so let's draw the Cayley tree. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look uh, at the identity and I'm looking at G and I'm looking at GH. You're going to see in a second why those are the points that I'm looking at. So remember, what we want to check is we want to compare 
H, uh, we want to compare the morphism applied to GH versus we want to apply it to G and we want to apply it to H. I'm overloading notation terribly here as I'm seeing uh, because I'm calling my element and my quasi-morphism H. So let's call this guy D prime. Okay, so these are the three elements I'm drawing. And then because these are in a tree, they span a subtree. So I'm gonna look at the subtree that these three points span. And now observe that the count of W on G, G prime, uh, let's say right here. So if I count, let's say a W as I go to G, this is the same as the number of non-overlapping subpaths of the geodesic from E to G labeled by W, right? So this is a path, this is a geodesic in the Cayley graph. And instead of saying, I'm writing this as a reduced word and I'm asking myself, how often does W appear? What I'm saying is maybe there's a copy of W here and maybe there's a copy of W here and there's another one here. And that's why this count is three. And so what you can immediately see from this picture is that, aha, if I do this, if a copy of W appears on this initial leg from the identity to the midpoint on this tripod, then I'm counting it both for E goes to G and for E goes to GG prime. So uh, take the tripod on E G uh, G G prime with midpoint um, M. And now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say that a copy of W or W inverse on uh, E M counts here, so I'm going to write a plus by saying, so this counts as a plus or a minus if I do this count. And in this column, I'm going to say, aha, I counted this with the same sign um, for, uh, for G. What about this guy? What happens if I have a copy? So just let me write W or W inverse on M going to G. What happens if I, if I have something here? Well, let's observe that if you think about it like this, the identity is nothing special. So counting W in G prime, instead of going from E to G prime, because everything is group invariant, I might as well go from G to G G prime, because that's the same geodesic just shifted by, uh, by, by G. So I can count on G, G, G prime. So if you think about it like this, I see that if a W appears here, then I'm counting it with a plus or a minus if it's a W inverse. If I go, oops, I don't count it at all here. So here I don't count it at all, but here I count it with a plus or a minus if I go to G and I count it with the opposite sign if I go from G to G, right? If W is oriented like this, I'm counting it as a plus one as I go like this, and then I'm counting it as a minus one that, that goes like this. So these two columns look really good because uh, the sum still works. So here the sum is the same, here the sum is the same as well because it's zero here and they cancel out there. Okay. And the rest works very similar. So if I'm here, so if I have a W or a W prime on M going to G, G prime, this is counted with its natural sign here. This is not counted at all when I go to G and it's counted with the same sign. Here. So that's good. These are these here. So the only ones I haven't counted yet 
are these. So there might be copies of W which overlap the central point and aren't completely contained in the others. So W or W prime containing M. And here, uh, I'm not going to make any, any kind of uh, statement. So now we're done. Why are we done? Because in the first three columns, we actually have equality in this sum. If I'm looking at this H on the product versus the sum of the H's, it's exactly the same value. And here I don't quite know, but I observe that there aren't so many of them, right? There are at most, right? There, is, there could be one like this, there could be another one like this, and there could be another one like this. But since I'm only ever counting non-overlapping copies, um, there won't be many of these. And so this tells you that just as we want, if I look at the value on the sum, it might not be exactly the same as the value, the sum of the values is not exactly the same as the value on the product, but it isn't far off. So this is in fact a quasi-morphism. Okay, and now for the first time in this mini course, but not the last, uh, one has to be brave. And what I mean by this is that one needs to stare at something that worked and try to do something which seems ridiculously ambitious, and then it just somehow also works. So my first reaction to this wasn't this, but some people's reaction to this could be to say, well, why don't we try doing this? not in a tree, but in a hyperbolic space. And why don't we try to count occurrences of paths in an abstract hyperbolic space? That's not so bad. But what if the hyperbolic space is something like the curve graph, which is locally infinite, non-proper, doesn't have unique geodesics, nothing is finite. Then you might justifiably be a little bit worried what I even mean by counting subpaths. Right, this all works super neatly because in a tree, I have a unique geodesic and the geodesics form these tripods. In a hyperbolic space, I have coarsely unique geodesics which form coarse tripods, but it's good enough. So, um, right, so here's a theorem. And this is due to Bestina and Fujiwara. And what does it say? So it says that suppose that X is a hyperbolic graph, uh, no assumptions. I mean, it's connected geodesic and Gromov hyperbolic. G acts on X as isometries. Um, assume that there exists a G in G such that G acts on X logstodromically, and G is not equivalent to G inverse. I'm gonna tell you later what this means. And I'm also immediately going to say that that's not the version that we want, or there exist G and H, both logstodromic, and G is not the same as H. This is akin but much stronger than saying that these are independent loxodromics. It's not just saying that they have four different points at infinity. It's much, much stronger. I'll tell you later what it is. But the point is that if you have this, then uh, G admits an unbounded quasi-morphism. And I want you to see this as a generalization of this trick. So it is also counting, but what is it counting? The idea is, so the idea is to count occurrences of a segment in axis. So the idea is I have this loxodromic element and this loxodromic element, by definition of what it means to be loxodromic, will have a quasi axis, right? So there's somehow in X, there's this. So A of G is a quasi axis 
of G. And then what I want to do is I want to look at a subpath between some point, I don't know, P and GP. And then this, because it's a invariant quasi-geodesic, this sort of repeats. So what I want to do is I want to cross my fingers and get this machinery to work to say, well, if I only had a way of counting occurrences of this basic segment, then I could play this game where I say I build a quasi-morphism which tries to count how often do I have a path like this when I go from one place to the other. So that's, that's sort of the idea of what goes on. Except you're not worried. So first of all, you should be worried of what it means to count occurrences, and I'm not going to tell you. Talk to me afterwards if you really want to know. It's, it's sort of fun. But there's something else. Here, I've actually swept something under the rug. I've swept under the rug that these quasimorphisms are unbounded. So here I've sort of said, well, if I look at the quasimorphism for AB and I'm counting copies of AB, then clearly there are N of them. But that's really like two claims. That's the claim that as I keep iterating AB, I can fit more and more copies of AB in there. That's obvious. But it's also the claim that, remember, I have to subtract the number of inverse copies. That means that as I iterate AB more and more and more, um, I'm not picking up too many copies of AB inverse. Now, in the free group, that is obvious. But here, this is something we have to require. And this is what this weird G not twiddle to G inverse is for. Uh, so G not equal to... Uh, so G not equal to G inverse means there is no group element, maybe H in my group, such that if I apply this to the axis, it fellow travels in the opposite direction for a long time. So let me write it like this. So G is equivalent to this means there is something so that this follow travels this in the opposite direction for length less than L. L is some constant that depends on various things, right? So before you think about this, what's the idea? The idea is I have this nice geodesic and it makes progress, picks up copies of W, but maybe there's a group element which sort of moves this and turns it around so where this guy, this axis of G was going like this, maybe my group is able to turn the whole space around. And now the translated axis um, goes essentially through the same things, but backwards. And if this would happen, then if I do this count of how often does W appear minus how often does W inverse appear, then of course this won't grow, this can't grow. If you're confused by this, here's the easiest toy example. Imagine this G being conjugate to its inverse, right? This can happen in an abstract group. And if this happens, then you can actually take the quasi-axis for G and the thing that conjugates it to its inverse will turn it around. And you see that you will have a problem because if you have something like this, as I take powers, a quasi-morphism will try to make this, that tries to make this big, will try to make this small, right? It will make this very positive. It'll then make the negative powers very negative. So if I have something that's conjugate to its inverse, we are out of luck. We can't possibly find a quasi-morphism that's unbounded on this guy. And this is sort of a coarse version of this. Okay, I've said a lot of things. I'm out of time. So let's step back and... Uh, summarize. What should you take away from this? There's two things. First half, using these flat geometries, we have a big supply of maps that act loxodromically on the curve graph. What do they help us? Well, there's a general machinery that takes in a group action with lots of loxodromics and tries to spit out a quasimorphism. Um, so you can probably guess what G not equals H means. It means that the axis of G can't be moved to fellow travel the axis of H for longer. So 
this now actually sets out the game plan for the last uh, lecture where I'll put all the things together. So now we're ready to try and build something for Homeo. What are we going to try and build? We're going to try and build a curve graph that works for the action of Homeo zero. And the definition is actually surprisingly simple. You just take all the curves uh, and don't ever talk about isotopies. And then this will turn out to be a hyperbolic space. And leveraging mapping class group machinery, we will be able to build lots of independent loxodromics. And then we feed them into the, the best Vina Fujiwara machine and turn the crank, and it will spit out a quasi-morphism that will be unbounded on homeo zero. So that's sort of the, the, the game plan of what comes next. Okay, so next time um, we'll do that. Thank you for listening. Sure.